Yeah, well, on a, a recent visit to Michigan, um, a friend whose uh, vacation rental we were staying in recommended a book that he had on hand there, and it was called uh, Freshwater Fury by Frank Barkas. And it, um, it wasn't what one might call, you know, lighthearted beach reading. Um, which honestly doesn't really float my boat um, anyway. But uh, this was a, a documentary of first-hand accounts of survivors of the Great Storm of 1913, which hit the Great Lakes in November of that year. Being a fan of history and also of storm stories, it made for perfect reading for me. I enjoyed it very much. Dubbed as the uh, White Hurricane and the Frozen Fury, the 1913 storm was the only hurricane to ever develop over the Great Lakes. And in, and in four days of <clears throat> battering, the extra tropical cyclone, which means outside of the tropics, cyclone killed over 250 people and destroyed dozens of ships and shoreline there were there were even 12 bulk freighters some over 600 feet long that disappeared without a trace the storm brought um, 100 mile an hour winds uh, to the open stretches of water creating waves that towered above the decks of the ships making navigation to safe harbor nearly impossible they were thwarted at every turn and of course they had to be wary of being driven into the rocks and the storm was such that no one could do anything about what was happening or at least couldn't do much interviews fill the book um, of captains seamen first responders uh, onshore witnesses whose testimony filled in some of the blanks that were you know left by the sudden and complete disappearance of these huge ships and in the wake of the tragedy a total of 19 ships were sunk uh, with dozens more damaged beyond use in addition to that the ice and the snow in such vast quantities added to the mayhem and the grim tale of unimaginable fear, fear and suffering by this freshwater hurricane was told. One of the challenges that, that uh, Captain Cruz had during that November blow is the same challenges that operators of the Edmund Fitzgerald had, which sunk in Lake Superior in 1975 how to keep the bow that is the front of the ship at a 90 degree angle to the waves now we're going to tell that particular story in song it's known as a ballad um, a little bit later while we're eating we've got some some music arranged for background for you that will play from up here and so but i i, I ask the question do we understand how large waves have to be to do this kind of thing to break a ship in half or engulf it so it just disappears in seconds some people might ask you know what so very horrific can happen on a mere lake clearly they've never been to the midwest and spent much time on any of the great lakes and there's a reason for the name great lakes and november is a time when extra care should be exercised because in these what are called november witches as they're called on the the great lakes up to 50 foot high waves and some of them rogue waves and this other um, combination of waves can occur too known as the three sisters um terrifying combinations of moving water they are especially to be feared these walls of water can easily manipulate a ship so it situates 
parallel to the waves in a trough. You don't want to be in a trough. In severe storms, surrendering to being in the trough means there's little hope of avoiding being pummeled and capsizing and along with that instantaneous doom. Now I present this graphic picture to illustrate a couple of things. In our world today, we may be encountering storms of a magnitude not experienced before by any of us. And keeping the direction of the bow straight, the bow of our lives, we, we call for full steam ahead. We have to keep the engines running. Metaphorically speaking, we also employ the use of anchors, harnessing their drag to help us stay the course. But I ask then, what exactly does it mean practically for us these days? Do we pretend to possess invincibility, as William Ernest Henley suggests in his poem Invictus, I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul? Well, if you've been with us, you know that we've been in the book of 1 Peter for several months now, and we're still in chapter 1, and that's a good thing. Um, the letter from the Apostle Peter uh, to early followers of Jesus Christ brings perspective and direction, and I find it incredibly hope-giving and inspirational. Recall that Peter had sailed his share of rough waters and had been with Jesus when Jesus calmed the storm. And what, so what he says, what Peter says, of course, is worth considering, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you, you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your soul. That, of course, is 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. And so, followers of Jesus Christ, according to uh, 1 Peter 1, have a hope that is incredibly joy-giving, and yet we find in reality, in our experience sometimes, among many believers, in fact, that that joy-giving hope is sadly lacking. It's lacking. Peter also coaches us to, to honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. And we'll eventually get to chapter 3 where that is found. But what words those are? A well-anchored hope is one that focuses on sharing with others the reality of a vital relationship with Jesus Christ. So we've been talking about ships and storms and anchors and, you know, in the simplest sense, anchors are pretty straightforward. You know, you, you think of heaving a heavy chunk of metal overboard to weigh down a ship so that it doesn't drift away. I mean, but it's actually a lot more complicated or involved than that. And of course, in practice, the process is more nuanced and it only gets more complicated the larger the ship is. So what I want us to do then is to think big ship. Think of a big 
ship. Not something you trailer over to the Ridgeway Reservoir. Think big. There's a lot of big ships out there. Um, and a whole system with an anchor is a combination it's a combination of an anchor that's specifically designed to dig into the seabed that's most likely to be encountered. It's also a combination of that anchor and an enormous chain to keep it attached to the boat, of course. Keep it tethered so that it doesn't get away. And a machine called a windlass. A windlass which is a giant machine that lowers and raises an anchor by that chain. Dropping anchor can be as simple as letting the anchor free fall into the water, but it's a process that requires a skilled operator to make sure that the anchor doesn't start falling so fast that the brakes, which are a part of the windlass, can't stop it. Now, it's easy to think of, you know, an anchor as deriving its staying power from going down, but the process of anchoring is more about a horizontal force. As the current or the wind pulls a ship this way or that, the, the ship needs to anchor, needs its anchor to bite into the seafloor, but with enough slack in the chain that the boat, won't, the boat won't start dragging that hunk of metal all over the place. And that's a process that can actually involve motoring the thing around to make sure the chain doesn't get too taut. As soon as that happens, the anchor is not effective. Now, it could be your entire job as a Navy seaman to maintain an anchor. And what does the, you know, as we, we think of these things and it, on purpose, I want it to be visual. So we think of what our hope is like, I call attention to the image of deep moving water again. What does it conjure up in your mind? Deep moving water is a force almost without equal on this earth. And storms are tough to navigate if, if you're this little craft that's bobbing up and down on the surface. In contextualizing all of that, to where we are today, we think of the culture that we're in, evil may seem, you know, unleashed. And its exponential growth appears, you know, foreboding as it is. And follow the metaphor here, okay? A rogue wave, a rogue wave on the high seas. Now, I say the next phrase in hope that it doesn't come across, um, cliche but Jesus is our shelter in this in the time of storm he is our safe harbor and we you know we drop anchor into him and into his immovable truth 